no real pithy openings today, <laughs> Sam. It's it's an off season that's frenzied that feels like uh, things are changing. We're all by whipped the, up in a frenzy. We are. We Whippled. are. We are whipped up. Yeah, things are changing by the minute, by the hour. Hopefully, this has some shelf life. But we're coming to you here on a Thursday afternoon. We know who three of the four Nebraska coaching hires are. Yeah, we've had a few recruits uh, added to the mix, and man, it just feels like things are going a mile a minute. But uh, I don't know. What's this last week been like from your perspective, chasing down some of this coaching stuff? Well, I'm I'm um, I'm here. I'm uh, you know awake. Um, there's been a couple of long days, you know, certainly over the weekend, I think was when things kind of heated up both with, uh, with things that I believed were true and untrue. Um, and then it's been, you know, I think, I think the dominoes have kind of fallen the way that we kind of thought they were, uh, going to fall. Um, you know, we've got a lot to talk about. I mean, we've got coaches, we've got quarterbacks, Mm-hmm. We've got Adrian Martinez going into the portal. We've got Damian Daniels going into the portal. We've got recruiting this weekend. So there's just everything's moving pretty fast, and it's been kind of fun, but it's also been a little exhausting. Mm-hmm. And it's an important December. We knew it was going to be like this, yep. but um, yeah, it's been pretty intriguing. Where do you want to start? Some of the departures, the coaches, right off the top. Why don't we start with the coaches? Okay. And then we'll get into the quarterback piece, both the guy that left and the guy that's coming back. Well, the guys that are coming back, the guys that they're trying to get. And then we can kind of move to what's the next step. Let's do it. Coaching. Uh, so they hired um, Mark Whipple, Donovan Rayola. They hired Mickey Joseph last week. Last time we guys we came to you guys, it was before Mickey's hire. It was Jimmy. And me, I think this week it's Evan and me. Jimmy is talking to a college class down at UNL, doing his doing his duty, which I really appreciate. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting week. Um, there's a lot of ways we could kind of enter into this, but we'll just we'll just go with this. We'll start with the offensive coordinator, Mark Whipple, Pittsburgh. Was at, you know. On a, on, a, on a list that Nebraska was interested in pursuing. He wasn't the only guy on that list. Uh, my understanding is they interviewed really, in, in essence, three, uh, one of which was, was Graham Harrell, USC coordinator. Another one was Robert and I from Virginia. And then there was Whipple. Another candidate um, is probably somebody that they can't hire and no one will be hiring. And that's because of, you know, perhaps potential NCAA-related things that might come up. Mm-hmm. That was a high candidate, too, but I think that was crossed off the list pretty quickly as a result. Um, I think Nebraska tried to go into this process not only looking for the best possible coaches, but ne- not necessarily, but also coaches that they may not know, and they were going to be patient. And if there's a thing that, that, that I thought kind of unfolded toward the end of last week from my, from my perspective and my framework is that there was an impression that Nebraska wasn't getting it right, that mm. they were disorganized, they couldn't figure it out, they, were, you know, they, they didn't know what they were going to do. And I'm telling you, knowing kind of what I know about the search process, that's not accurate, that Nebraska did about as well as they were going to do in terms of the speed um, I think you could argue that there might have been some other guys that that could have gotten it. OC or offensive line coach that might have provided a different perspective. But I I kind of like Whipple. I mean, I can talk about his offense a little bit. Um, and then Rayola, which I'll let you kind of touch on a little, um, is an interesting hire. The one thing that you're going to get with him is an, as a level of NFL experience and seasoning that I think is encouraging on some level, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So he's been around the pro aspect of the sport. I think he can sell that to the kids. I think he will pair pretty well with Whipple because Whipple's offense, uh, Alarms and Bell's kids, is a pro-style offense. It's not a Oregon offense. It's not an option offense. It's not a triple option. It's not spread option. It's pro-style. That doesn't mean that they can't incorporate option elements into it but if you watch Pittsburgh if you watch UMass before it they aren't running 
they're running a spread pass, pro-style pass offense, what you would see um, in the NFL. Rayola fits in nicely with that. And then you have Mickey Joseph, who is, I think, A, a good receivers coach based on the development that he's done, and B, an elite recruiter. Mm. And so he needs to pan. I mean, he needs to pay off on the recruiting trail in the next five to seven days. They need to get some guys in here that he was able to go get in the last two weeks, and we'll see how it goes. With what you know about Whipple and, and the people that you've talked to already, how do you see what he's done sort of marrying what Scott Frost does at Nebraska and what they have done moving forward? You know, what, what have his tendencies been? How can he help? What do you think that sort of interplay is going to be? Because he's going to be the offensive coordinator. Scott has said that he's handing over the offense to a large degree, but I think we all can agree, too, that he's not going to totally divorce himself from the game plans or, or you know, helping with the offense. How do you see that blend sort of coalescing here uh, into next season? Well, that's a heck of a question, and I can give you a conditional answer. Based on what I know <clears> – <throat> Based on talking to Andrew Ford, who was one of his former quarterbacks, and a really good source. Like it was a half hour conversation with him. He was a three year starter for Whipple the three years before Whipple was at Pittsburgh. Mm. So we're not talking about somebody from 20 years ago. We're talking about somebody who just played for the guy right, right. before Kenny Pickett. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a passing offense. Uh, he is hard on the quarterbacks. The level of preparation that he puts into the quarterback position is significant and detailed and thorough. He's hard on his quarterbacks. They go into games very well prepared, I think. They're asked to do a lot from a mental perspective, and they're asked to get rid of the football. They're asked to throw the football, and they're asked to get rid of the ball and move in the pocket, not take sacks. And so there, I think there's going to be a level of synergy between Whipple and the quarterback that Nebraska did not possess when Mario Verdusco was the quarterback's coach. And this isn't a knock on Mario. It's Mario and Scott and Lubick and this three, you know, this three headed thing all pouring into the QB. I think it's going to be mostly Whipple and a little bit of Scott. But I, I don't think Scott, the way I would put it is, Scott is a, a very very knowledgeable offensive coordinator, a lot of different things. I don't know that Scott is a true what Whipple is quarterbacks coach. Mm. Like, I don't think he would describe himself as, yeah, my I, I, I'm the guy that coached in the NFL and did this and this. I think he would say, this guy really knows what he's doing. He can go take the quarterback and pull him aside. I can be back here and be the head coach. And so I think that's one of the biggest advantages. I think one of the priorities in the process was to get a person who could do that the way Whipple can do it. So that, that piece, I think, is helpful. I think it becomes then a question when these guys all sit down and they, you know, they just kind of chat. Um, I think you're going to have a very different kind of conversation about Okay, how much do we want to incorporate the run? And you have to have that conversation right away, Evan, oh, immediately. Yeah. Because you have to know who you're going to go get in the portal, and you have to be able to communicate to the kids already on your staff or already on your roster, here's what the hell we're going to do. And you need to know what we're going to do, so if you want to stick around and try to do what we're going to do, then you can stick around and do what we're going to do. But here's what we're not going to do, or here's what we don't intend to do. Um, and so you know, some of that's conditional on who you get in the portal, some of that's conditional on how much Frost. I mean, now, now you once you sign the contract, Scott Frost is can can go to him and say, "Now listen, I you know I still want a quarterback run component. Figure it out." Um, I can tell you that the minute that you ask for that, it it changes the dynamic of who you would bring in. Hmm. You're probably not going to bring in a certain guy. You're probably not bringing in Spencer Rattler. I'm not sure they would bring him in anyway. But so there's a little bit of a conditional answer there. His offenses have always been really consistent uh, when it comes to efficiency, consistent in not taking sacks, and consistent in throwing touchdown passes. And when I go through the stats each year that really matter to me as it relates to quarterback play and also the offense, this will sound kind of strange, but one of the seven stats I had at the beginning of the year was simply touchdown passes, raw touchdown passes. When you can throw touchdown passes, do you know how good of a team you usually are? 
pretty good. Good. And, and I'm just talking straight up touchdown passes. And this guy gets quarterbacks to throw touchdown passes. And I like that. Adrian threw 14 this year in 12, well, I'm sorry, in 11 games. Yeah. That's not enough, Evan. No. I, I think he threw four last year. They don't throw touchdown passes. You have to throw touchdown passes in this modern age of the football game. You can't, you can't run them all in. Now, Adrian had 13 rushing touchdowns, but it takes a lot of running to get that kind of wear and tear. Throwing touchdown passes is, 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 is a lot of ways how offenses get it done. Mm. And can he pick it through, what, 42? 43. 43 for yep. Pittsburgh this year. And that's up. It's a little bit of a contrast there. A little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it was an interesting couple hires because you contrast Whipple's experience and kind of his background with Donovan Rayola, who is 38, essentially the same age as Greg Austin is, had that, that NFL background. But you look at his resume. I mean, as recently as 2014, he was an intern at Hawaii. In 2017... He was an assistant for a, a Division three school in Illinois. And so when I look at guys like that, I always am fascinated to see, like, where where did the big break come from, right? Like for Scott Frost, um, in his coaching career, it was that leap he made from northern Iowa to Oregon. And so, like, you know, for, for Rayola, that leap was, again, the, the D3 assistant in 2017 to being part of the Chicago Bears organization in 2018, and that came through a connection with um, a, a pretty well-known, now retired offensive line coach, Harry Highstand. Um, mm-hmm. And so Rayola worked as a GA at Notre Dame with him in 15 and 16, and so that was the connection that got him with the Bears. So it, kind of interesting to see how quickly he's risen. Doesn't have any recruiting experience uh, at the major college level. <coughs> hasn't run his own room. Uh, at the college or professional level. So it's an interesting hire. I mean, people know his name. Obviously, people know his older brother, Dominic, and what he did for Nebraska. Um, You know, the one thing that I have heard from people about Donovan working under a guy like Highstand is he's going to be really technical. And, Mm -hmm. like, to the point to where in some of their film reviews, they might review five plays in an hour because of how detailed they are. That's the kind of tutelage he got under high stand. And, and you talk, you listen to some of the interviews that his former players did elsewhere. Uh, you know, he would hammer home technique, 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 like every play, where are your hands, where are your feet, uh, where are your eyes, all this stuff. And so I think that's uh, sort of the starting point maybe for what Nebraska is getting in him as a guy who's technical, but then also has, Maybe that fire, that passion. Um, he seems like a guy who's really going to, you know, not unlike Greg Austin, I think, get into in, into the players and really have a passion for what you're doing in the trenches too. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think um, he's uh, he's he's the hire that I think, you know, uh, fans are skeptical of, but also will root for because. At this moment, I think there's an impression, well, he got the job because of his last name, because he's his brother was a Husker All-American. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fair to say that if his brother wasn't a Husker All-American, maybe he's not getting hired in Nebraska. That doesn't necessarily mean it would be a poor hire. Um, the thing that I like about him is that I think he probably does all the things that a Mark Whipple would want in an offensive line coach. He knows all those things. And so that's encouraging. I think it's good that he's he's the kind of he's the kind of person, um, you know, that that can come in and, and maybe understand all those things. I, I, the fire part is fine, you know. I think that's fine. Um, certainly, you want offensive linemen to be violent and physical, and all of those things. I think those are all really good things, and you want to be physical and nasty. I, I don't really question the human physical toughness of Nebraska's offensive line. I think they're tough people. I mean, you gotta be. Yeah. So I don't know that I would describe it that way. When I watch Nebraska's offensive line, and I'm going through the process of watching all the games from last year, I'm very early in that process because I've watched honestly more Pittsburgh in the last week than I have uh, Nebraska. But, um, 
you know, I don't know that I would describe it as a physicality issue. I think they miss blocks. Mm. So the technician piece is, I think, helpful. Yeah. I don't know that it's a physicality issue when no one blocks somebody. They didn't block them because they didn't they didn't block them, and not because of a physical thing, but they just there's run throughs. I mean, Nebraska's offensive line struggled with run throughs constantly. Nebraska's offensive line struggled constantly with, you know, short pass sets that left them wide open to inside moves, much less outside moves. You didn't always know if it was coming inside or outside. Um, all kinds of little things like that. I thought the line play got better in the last two weeks of the season. We talked a about lot it. better, but it was still an issue. You know, like I don't know. We'll just have to see. Go ahead. Well, because we talked about on this podcast a few weeks ago about uh, RPOs and how that can be a challenge for the line because those the, those blockers don't know before a play if they're supposed to be run blocking or no pass question. blocking. Yeah, how no how question. how much does that change with what Whipple's doing? How much RPO have you seen? Or does that go away and they uh, have more of a sense of what they're being asked to do pre-snap? Well, I, I think that RPO realities are are there now in the sense that you want to be able to, if you want to fake as, uh, an inside zone run and pair that with a slant, that's an RPO. Could give it to the running back, could not. Nebraska's RPOs were more like the quarterback could run it, the running back could run it, you could throw a quick pass to the side, you could throw a slant. You could throw some other longer pass. Like, there's so many things built in that I think sometimes the offensive lineman didn't always know where the guys were behind him. And Adrian's pocket manipulation, pretty good at the beginning of the year, I thought, went back to the, I'm kind of back here. Oh, man, I'm back here like 11 yards. I'm way back here. I'm, I'm holding the ball. I'm looking for something 27 yards downfield. In Whipple's offense, I don't think you're going to see much of that. I think you're going to see run pass options where the quarter, where the running back runs it or the quarterback throws it, and I think you're going to see guys stay in the pocket, right? They're going to sit their, as I like to say, ass in the pocket. They're going to anchor down in there. They're going to keep, you know, obviously stay light on their feet, but they're going to stay in there. And in staying in there, that opens the entire field up to you. Whipple has a lot of compressed formations, and when you're in compressed formations, a couple things happen. One, usually they're staggered wide receivers. One guy and and you one guy goes after the other, and you're trying to create the inability for our defenses to run man defense. Because when you're compressed, that's hard because they're staggered. They do a nice job of bringing an immediate drag route over the uh, over the middle of the field and leaking the back out off, basically rubbing off the backside of the drag route. So there's, boom, check down, drag route. They do a really nice job of double look-ins. In other words, double slants where you bring guys, they have look-in routes on third and medium and third and short. It's, uh, thank you. I, I've, I've missed them. <laughs> Nebraska's yeah. main pass concept last year was a was two crossers who would, you know, who would, who would cross each other, stop, and then a tight end that went behind that, and they'd form an inside triangle, and you threw to whichever guy was open. But before that could ever happen, the guys had to cross. And so the triangle didn't form until the guys crossed, and then they would have stops. And sometimes this play work, don't be, to be clear. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get the tight end, but I love two, double, two, two slants. Boom, boom. And you don't usually throw to the second, the outside slant. You usually throw to the inside slant. And what do you bring off of that? Well, here, you bring in double slants, and then you bring a wheel off of it. And then all of a sudden, you know, you got a you got a slot wheel, double slants outside. These guys bring in the safety down here, and you got a guy over the top one on one in a post. So Sean Watson used to do this stuff. Bill Callahan used to do this stuff. Riley used to do this stuff. Riley did some other things too. This is kind of what Whipple does. Like he, the routes look good, the routes look crisp. All these things sort of fit together. When the guys run the routes, they run the routes. They're it's not it's not smudgy. It's not um, it's not liquid, and a lot of times when you watch Nebraska's pass game, and I'm not trying to knock Scott because I think he's brilliant. Some of the plays they run are unbelievable. I can't even imagine how he thinks of them up. But you know, you know how you would wonder what the hell is where where what's the communication between Martinez and Torre on that play? Because mm -hmm. the routes are smudgy, like you don't, and I don't put that on Adrian. I think a lot of times Torre was just kind of. In, imperfect on a route and so little stuff like that 
like if you watch the watch the cut ups of pits what I've done a lot of here in the last week or so, they just their dig routes are dig routes. They're fourteen yards deep. They're behind the they're behind the the linebackers that are dropping back. You wait until the hole the shots in the hole. You throw it in between the two linebackers. All that stuff. Mm. That's how it's kind of supposed to look, Evan. Like now, Pittsburgh's really good. They have a really good quarterback. He gets rid of the ball fast. He's really accurate. And their receivers are better than Nebraska. They're a little smaller, but they're really good route runners, and they don't screw around. They have a tight end that's about as good as Austin Allen, so there's that piece. But, yeah, I mean, I think Whipple will bring some of those things, and you you get kids locked in really quick. And hopefully they're able to they're able to do that quickly. So that's why, I mean, I could talk about this often, and we will. We'll talk about it many times in the off season, but just short short order. Think Callahan, think Watson, think Riley, think those things in good ways. Run game is a little bit limited. Zone, kind of a man scheme at times, kind of a gap scheme, but there isn't a lot of pullers. A little bit of pin and pull, a lot of zone. They run the ball more in the second half than they do in the first half. Yeah. Yeah. And then you add on to that Mickey Joseph, who, as you said, was hired to last recruit. To, to recruit. And, and that's kind of what I was going to mention. I mean, I've. I have to have kind of keep a running list of the guys that they have offered since he's been here. I mean, it's it's been fairly unbelievable to see uh, the the speed with which they have offered guys, even in the few days that he's been here. Um, he's from Louisiana. Obviously, they were hitting up a lot of former um, LSU commits. I mean, you, you, you can kind of get, I'll give you some of the headliners. Uh, Trevante Citizen from Lake Charles, Louisiana. They were there on Tuesday. I mean, he's he, running back. What did I say? I think you did. Oh yeah, running back. Yeah, from uh, from Louisiana State, he just committed. Uh, this guy for one of the best names of the year, DeColdest Crawford. The best. Yeah. Uh, what a name! Receiver who gets the Nebraska offer and subsequently decommits from LSU. Uh, another running back commit, Shaz Preston. Um, well, I guess was an LSU lean. He wasn't committed at that time. Yeah, He's probably that seems not like a tough pull. Probably not coming to Nebraska. Yeah. But but again, you're you're just seeing work being done. And so whether they're able to... Can I just say this real briefly? Yeah. Nebraska has an advantage in that the LSU's new head coach is Brian Kelly. I'm just telling you. There are people that want to play for that guy, and there are people who don't. Yeah, sure. Like, he is more divisive than if... you Like, if they had brought in some... If they brought in Lincoln Riley, ain't nobody decommit from that class. But Brian Kelly... That's true. You either are like, yeah, this guy is kind of a jerk, but I'm going to stick with him, or, uh, okay, I'm not going to go there. Mm-hmm. Like, Nebraska can benefit from the fact that Brian Kelly is the coach there now because he's going to rub some people in this world wrong, kind of like me. Like, he, he'll, he'll rub people wrong. I mean, it's, it's just kind of, it's kind of amazing to see the, these offers that Nebraska is getting and the fact that they're in the conversation with some of these guys when you look at their other offers. I mean, you're talking top SEC offers yeah. – that because of circumstances, Nebraska maybe is in the running for late. Uh, you know, it's just it, it's really fascinating. All in the strength of the relationship that Mickey Joseph has with these guys, with their families. So real stuff. Yeah, I mean that's why he he came aboard was to be that sort of ace recruiter and to see the work being done. You know, they haven't uh, produced anything from that quite yet. They they visited Miles Brennan, the former LSU quarterback. Yeah. Um, on the strength, I'm sure, partly of that relationship with oh, yeah. Mickey Joseph, no doubt. Um, so it's been really fascinating to see what that's like and whether that pays dividends here in the next week or so or whether that's a 2023 and beyond thing, we'll have to see. But um, obviously that's a guy with a ton of connections who's making a, a quick impact. I think they've got pretty good receivers in the program now. Do you? I do. It. We, I mean, we talked about this a lot, about – why wasn't Xavier Betts on the field late in the game? Why wasn't Omar Manning on the field late in the game? And it could be a lot of different reasons, but it feels like it can't hurt to have a guy like Mickey Joseph in there who who can develop these guys who I think by a lot of accounts teaches in such a way that's, that's understandable and relatable um, to the point where you're not having to think things through all the time. Um, and maybe we'll see if Mark Whipple's offense is part of, uh, you know, an, an easier thing to learn too than what it's been at Nebraska. Maybe, maybe. I think it's probably. I think it's probably pretty technical and dense, but simultaneously, if this makes sense, you're learning what you're learning. 
I, I think it's hard to go from today we're going to pro style to triple option to um, kind of a power spread to this over here to uh, quarterback dart. I mean, Scott Frost's offensive repertoire is vast. Like it's so it's so multiple mm-hmm. um, that I do think it can be challenging for receivers to know all the things that they need to know to stay on the field all the time. Torreo was able to learn it, but you know he was a fifth year senior too. Mm-hmm. Um, Betts, Manning, Alante Brown, Will Nixon, Camonte Grimes, Sean Hardy, Latrell Neville. Who am I missing? Brody Belt, who I think is going to play, who's going to who's going to flourish under a guy like Whipple. Who am I missing? Anybody else? Those are the highlights. Yeah. This is a pretty good little. This is a pretty good group of guys. It's a little small, you know. It's the, they could add a few more to the a few more to the room, like a transfer receiver, like this Tyrese Chambers from Florida International is mm-hmm. really good. Yep. But this is a pretty good group. I I think Mark Whipple will come here and go. Yeah, we can work with this. I think Mickey Joseph will come here and go. Yeah, it's not LSU. He won't say that aloud, but but yeah, this isn't. This is decent. And so. Um, knowing that, I think I think they can get better there quickly. And you mentioned the tight ends too in your uh, oh, in, yeah. in your Whipple story. I mean, Austin Allen's moving on, but if Will collects back, uh, Chris Hickman, Thomas Fedoni's healthy on down the list. Uh, you got to feel like that's going to be a weapon pretty quickly too. Allen mentioned to me, and this will be in a future report story that I do every single year of young guys. He said AJ Rollins is actually the guy that he thought had improved the most. Hmm. And AJ is a guy that we don't talk about a lot because, you know, he was redshirting and he we were questionable about what, whether he was going to play tight end or outside linebacker. But Austin Allen, who I trust, like he gives you the straight stuff. Absolutely. He's like, actually, he goes, AJ Rollins is the guy that I think has come the furthest along. Hmm. And I mentioned Fedoni in that. Now, Fedoni's ahead of Rollins, I believe. But Fedoni didn't play that much. Even when he could late in the year, he didn't play. And then when you have an all big ten and ten tight end, you don't need him to play. Right. But he also didn't play. Which I thought was notable. Mm. So he's you know, he's gonna get better too. Well let's let's talk about the quarterback position yeah. a little bit. Did you guys talk much about Martinez last week or had he transferred by then? I don't remember. He had not. He hadn't. Okay. Well, no, he had. No, oh, that's true. He had. I think he I think I think he transferred. Yes. What day did he transfer? Thursday? It's all Tuesday? running together. I think it was a Tuesday. Yeah, we for talked some about reason. it. Okay, so so he goes into the portal, um, which by the way, it's not impossible for a guy to come out of the portal. Fresno State just had a quarterback who did that, but you know, it, it, I'm not saying that I expect that to happen, but it's just sort of the technicality of it. I think it's over. It's uh, to quote Danny Nee from many years ago. It's <laughs> no, it's over, Nick. It's over. It, it, I think it'd be kind of cool if he came back, but I don't think he may be, he may or may not be ready for next year. Hmm. Well, and, so, so, know, so so just I guess let's with it, we'll get into names here too in a minute. But what as you've seen Whipple's offense and as you studied the film, what are some just characteristics of a guy of a quarterback that would succeed as in an offense that Nebraska is going to run here in the future? Accurate, good in the pocket, athletic, but not necessarily a runner, a big time runner. Mobile, um, uh, very accurate within 15 yards, knows how to work the offense, good decision maker, um, good in the red zone, has a fastball. You got to, you know, there's got to be times when in this in this offense and a lot of offenses, you have to have, you've got to be able to smoke one in on, you know, third and medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this may not be... It just maybe the games I've watched. I wouldn't describe it as an offense where you got to have a 75-yard arm, um, but you have to have a fastball because there are some hole shot situations in the system where you've got to be able to to think fast and throw it real hard um, because there are ways to slow down any offense, and one of the things you can do is you can have a zone defense that kind of squeezes – squeezes the middle of the field and you better you better be able to fire it in but those are the things have you found it to be a an offense that requires you know eight nine ten play drives or is this a, a big play offense where you know a guy can get loose for 60 or 70 they don't have a lot of that in the run game uh i wouldn't describe it as a as a uniquely big play offense they had a lot of big plays this year at pittsburgh 
um, and they tend to average a lot of yards per play, but I would describe it as more similar to Mike Riley's offense, which had a lot of big plays in his first first year. Mm-hmm. Um, they had some players in that first year that I think helped him do that, but but uh, I would describe it like that. Like, okay. If they had Tanner Lee, I'd feel pretty good. Now Tanner threw too many interceptions, but if they had Tanner Lee running the offense, I'd feel pretty good about it. Hmm. I think it, I'd be like, yeah, that, that seems like a good fit. Um, but, you know, we watched Tanner Lee. He threw a lot of interceptions. He too. did. Now Danny's offense, Danny Langsdorff's offense, was more aggressive than, I, than Whipple's appears to be. I mean, Danny pushed the envelope a lot. Uh, and and I, it hurt him, but um, but this is similar. I mean, there's there's similar concepts in there. So yeah, it'll be interesting. I was reading up some on on Whipple and and his quarterbacking philosophy um, from the the Pittsburgh Post Tri- or Tribune Review, uh, and and he made a, a point as did you know the, the folks that you talked with Sam about. You can't put a guy in a in a, in a cookie cutter. Like you have to find their individual strengths and go from there. Um, and I'm writing about this for the next day or so, but you look at some of the, the guys that Nebraska has been linked to. We, met, we mentioned Miles Brennan from LSU. He's a guy who, in theory, could have two more years of eligibility if he gets a red shirt from missing this year, medical red shirt. They were down visiting him uh, in his home this week, so that's, that's an obvious connection. Uh, another LSU transfer, Max Johnson, a little bit younger. He's been the starter for the last year and a half. Um, just entered the portal this week. He has a brother who also decommitted from LSU. He's like one of the top tight end prospects in the country. Um, and so his name's Jake. And so that's another one I think that's interesting to watch just because of those connections that we mentioned. And then the other one that there's sort of a, di- a direct, I guess, piece of evidence that Nebraska would at least know is Chubba Purdy from Florida State. And it was interesting because Whipple visited him as a member of the pit staff on Monday. Purdy tweets out a picture of him visiting their home. Whipple had offered him out of high school before he went to Florida State. Right. So those guys know each other too. He hasn't really had a ton of really no starting experience. He's been a reserve for the last couple of years. He's had an injury that's that sort of kept him off the field. But that's somebody else um, whose brother, by the way, is is Brock Purdy at Iowa State that uh, it'd be curious to see how much Nebraska would pursue him moving forward there as well. And then, you know, and then you can kind of start speculating too. And, and there are guys that are going into the portal every day. You don't really know um, when that next guy might drop that could change everything. Guys that haven't declared yet or guys that, um, I mean, even just today, there was a guy from Incarnate Word, Cameron Ward, who entered. He was an FCS, uh, I think he threw 47 touchdowns, yeah, 47 touchdowns at the FCS level this year. So he's on the market today. So this thing isn't over, right? Like no. just because of who we know is on the market right now, that thing could change quite a bit, even oh, yeah. in the next few weeks. There's multiple FCS quarterbacks that are still playing. Yep. There's multiple FCS players who are going to move up after this season for free. People, that's the most underrated aspect of this thing is how these kids move up from FCS now. Mm-hmm. Um, and Samari Touré is probably you know is the best example. Um. How do I put this? You know the name. I know the name. We're not going to say it because I don't know. But there is a name out there of somebody who might go into the transfer portal or might not, and they haven't done that yet, that if that person does, that person will be the first, that'll be the person that Nebraska wants. Mm-hmm. And it's a big name. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Absolutely. I, I'm not trying to be cryptic and weird. What we won't do is say that there's a person who, who hasn't been in the portal yet that, that – if they're not in the portal yet, they're not in the portal. But we kind of came into this possession of this information through another hand. and That would be a big addition. As it stands, the person who's probably the biggest name in there is Spencer Rattler. And I don't know how quickly Nebraska wants to move on him, if they want to move at all. Rattler's shorter. And I don't know what his skill set is in terms of mo- moving in a pocket. Miles Brennan... Uh, you know, I've seen reports that the entire coaching staff went down to see him. It wouldn't surprise me if he visits this weekend. Brennan is a classic, big, pro-style guy who has been hurt the last two seasons. Um, I think there's a lot of things about his game that are good. The other kid went into the portal, too. Uh, Johnson, I think, mm-hmm. the starter this year. Yep. Uh, so he's another example of somebody you could potentially go after. Don't like him as much. 
I don't know. I've watched him four times this year, and I just did, wasn't blown away. Um, but maybe he's the guy. Uh, Brennan is an interesting person. Um, but there are other names that are not in the portal yet. Uh, and this name that I that you and I have in mind may not be there. They, they may, you know, uh, stay where they're at or go into the NFL or there's a lot of other things maybe that could happen. But that would be a big name that would enter. Um, but there's other names that are going to go in. And this FCS thing that you mentioned is a legit deal. There, you know, Frost knows firsthand what it's like to go get an FCS quarterback in Vernon Adams right. and transform that guy into a – I mean, they won 10 games. They weren't a national champion contender, but they won 10 games with Vernon Adams. Nebraska would take that. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. So um, this is where Scott can can do kind of his magic a little bit. Uh, I think Whipple's probably been pretty contained to the East Coast and out there. I think Scott has pretty vast – network within the Pacific Northwest where a lot of these quarterbacks are at Mm -hmm. these FCS studs um, you know he can he can maybe work his contacts and as I've said before there are a couple things that there are there are areas in which I am skeptical of, of the work that Scott Frost has done we all know what those things are but there are areas in which I think they are better than we have given than than we've often said I think they're pretty good recruiters and I think they're pretty good when their backs are against the wall at going out and getting some guys. Now, Wandell Robinson had a little bit better season this year at Kentucky than Samari Touré did. He certainly had a better season at Kentucky than he would have had at Nebraska. I guarantee you. Yeah. But that wasn't a bad – they lost Wandell, they got Touré. No, I, I don't remember many people during the season going, oh, we wish we had Wandell. Right. And that's despite him having a great year. I, I didn't hear that from people. So Nebraska does a little bit better at this than we give them credit for. They need to get the running back position right. They got to get it right. And they, I, I believe, I have been told, and I believe that Frost will get that right. So they'll get the names. I don't know if it's all going to work out, but Scott Frost will go out and get backs with Joseph. Without Joe, they will, they will, they will address the position, and they, it will improve. So let's talk about that. So there's still the one coaching vacancy out there. Yeah. Nebraska doesn't have a special teams coordinator. I mean, they do in Mike Dawson, but not a standalone. Right. They don't have a running backs coach currently. Right. Uh, how do you see that sort of shaking out? And is the higher the last move? Is the reshuffling just starting? Kind of maybe break that down where you see that right yeah. now. Yeah. So there's one spot left, and where they stand right now is I believe that they want to focus on special teams. It's my understanding that, you know, after they made the announced the hires yesterday, the next step in the process was, all right, now what are we going to do with specials? And so um, ideally you would love to get a pairing where you get a running backs coach and a special teams coach, but one of the people who does that, Ricky Brumfield, is out, according to a source that I have. And so he's out. He's out of the running. So that's one name that's out. The name that obviously people default to is Bill Bush, Bill Bush has done almost everything in the sport of football, but he hasn't coached the he hasn't coached running backs. <laughs> he's a defensive coach. And so he's been a defensive coordinator and he's been a special teams coordinator and a defensive position coach and a recruiter and a analyst and all these other things. I don't know that running backs is his milieu. And so if you if you promote him to that role, to the special teams coordinator role, you, you don't have a running backs coach unless you move Sean Beckton into that role and you move someone else to tight ends and all these other things. And so I will be curious to see how they address that. Here's the other thing, Evan. They could have hired Bill Bush a week ago. Mm-hmm. That could have been the first hire. If that's what you wanted to do at that position, and that's absolutely what you wanted to do, and you wanted to do it to the extent that you were willing to not have a running backs coach in the room, then you would have done it. So they haven't done that yet. Uh, as of, you know, what is it, 4 o'clock Thursday afternoon, they haven't made that higher. Now, they might make it as we're speaking. They might make it tomorrow. They might make it tomorrow, you know, over the weekend. Bill Bush may very well be the special teams quarter, but he isn't He isn't yet, which tells you something. Um, it tells you a little bit, yeah. right? So we'll see. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know yet if he's the guy guy. We've heard a lot of strong candidates, favorites, all this other stuff. Is he the guy guy? Uh, well, we'll see. If he is, then he'll be hired. And he could have been hired already. So I assume that he's very, very high on that list, but I don't know 
that he is uh, alone on the list. And the t- I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on this too, but the timing, or I suppose the sequence of the hires is fascinating because what we heard from Frost in the in the weeks after he fired most of his offensive staff was that whoever the new OC would be would have a say potentially in those next hires. And yet right. Mickey Joseph was the first hire when mm-hmm. they were still in talks with Whipple and other candidates. Right. Whipple's hired the same time as Rayola. Maybe he had a say in that one. Maybe he not. He didn't. So I, I, I mean, I find that interesting. I suppose, first of all, maybe that says that Mickey Joseph was such a good hire that you well, had, I think to get that had to be guy okay when he with the there. hire. I don't think it was a Mark. Would you like to? Inter- no, they interviewed Rayola before they interviewed Whipple. Okay, so they it's interviewed just Rayola last Friday that- with Jeff Quinn at Notre Dame, mm-hmm. and then they interviewed Robert and I. Then, uh, and then they interviewed Graham Harrell and Mark Whipple on Sunday. They interviewed Rayola before they interviewed Whipple, and and I don't know how it all went on with the offensive line, but I'll tell you this: I guarantee you, Donovan Rayola is. Much cheaper than Jeff Quinn. Mm. Sure, but it's, so it, I guess all that to say, they made the hires of Joseph and Rilla without, I suppose, the direct consult of Mark Whipple, the new yeah. OC. I think he'll be fine with the wide receivers coach. And so, yeah, I'm sure he is. <laughs> but it's just it's just interesting because yeah. I think there was this this no, this point. preconceived notion that the the OC would be the first domino to fall, and yeah. then everything else would come after it, and it hasn't played out that way. And so you wonder how much influence. Whipple may or may not have on this last hire on the offensive side, special teams, however it ends up. Well, this much I'll tell you. The two hires that they made at those other two positions fit very, very well into his scheme. That's what they're teaching. I mean, Mickey Joseph isn't teaching Army football at LSU. And Donovan Rayola, I know that system. Uh, I'm a Bears fan. I've watched every game that the Bears have played for a, a while. Um you couldn't watch them when you were a kid because they were only watching them if they were on TV. So it wasn't until recently that you could kind of, you know, get around that um, and start watching them through Red Zone or or through Sunday Ticket or whatever. I mean, Donovan Rayola has been teaching things that Whipple does, and the Bears' offense is, to be perfectly honest with you, too friggin' complex. So, and that's one of the reasons that you know their their head coach is going to probably get fired. So I'm sure Riola was looking to move on. I mean, I think Donovan Riola would have been a head offensive line coach in the NFL very quickly. Um, this way he'll go to college. He may not be there that long. Never know. Because Scott Frost may not keep his job. He just And we're being honest. We know that. Yeah. So you know, this is a way for Riola to get you know, a full-time job and be the head guy. I'm sure he'll be an offensive line coach for 25 years. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, yeah, but you make a good point that – it wasn't the offensive coordinator first. What I will say is that the coordinator they got pairs quite nicely with now. If it were Brent Davis, no, I'm just telling you, no. That was the big name du jour last week, early last week. What about Brent Davis at Army? You you want to want you want to run the triple option? Okay. <laughs> People don't understand. Uh, the athletic Nicole Auerbach had a good story yesterday about, and it was, she did a really good job on the story. She quoted Jeff Munkin, who is the head coach at army. I don't really agree with what Munkin was saying, but she did a good job of getting him to say some of the things about, well, why don't you just, you know, take your best athlete on your team and put him at quarterback. And it might've been a defensive back somewhere else, Cam Taylor Britt and, you know, run the offense and you'll win games. And I'm like, you might win games for a couple of years, but then you won't. That's the problem with the offense is you, you, know, you can't guarantee that you're going to be consistently good because you, you, you can't draw kids to your team. So she did a good job with that story, and I, I just don't see how that offense gets any more, uh, gets any pop, more popular in, uh, in college football than with the service academies. Hmm. Uh, so we also have some kind of comings and goings in the last week. We Damian do. Daniels declared for the NFL draft. Yep. Um, and then they added th- two two commits, <laughs> Nebraska did. Yeah. Malcolm Hartzog, defensive back from Mississippi, who's sort of a do-everything, running back, returner, uh, athlete for them. And defensive Brody, back, he'll play defensive That's where he'll, he'll play in Nebraska, yes. And then Brody Tagaloa from uh, De La Salle in, in California. He was a guy – that a lot of schools were recruiting as a tight end. Nebraska liked him as a defensive lineman. 
And so uh, Nebraska's class is up to 11 there. They added a, a Charlie Weinrich, a preferred walk-on kicker good from pick. Kansas. Yeah, he's a good player. Who's, who's had some success in high school, too. No question. So, um, I don't know. Any, what, what stands out to you there about like some of the, the moves kicker. they've made? I mean, he's got a big leg, uh, a sharp kid. Um, I think he's got a shot. Now, they, they offered the Tommy Bleak Road kid at Furman, the, the kicker there. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll come. Kicking's kicking, no matter what level you're at. Sometimes it can change based on the climate. You know, maybe a little harder to kick in the Big Ten than it is in whatever league Furman's in. Southland, whatever it is. Um, but I like the kicker. Uh, the, you know, the Hart's dog could make a potential return option. The other guy's a three- or four-year developmental project, mm-hmm. which is okay. I didn't, you know, I don't know if you watched the, the limited film there is of Brody Tagaloa. But it's, you know, it was fine. Yeah, he was they, hurt this year, and they didn't play much because of the, the COVID year before that. Yeah, he didn't play a lot in the last two years. A little slow, you know. They'll they'll reshape his body and take care of him. And um, I think they're pretty good at that position. But you can't count on everybody being, you know, Casey Rogers. You need a nose for next year, don't you? If you're Nebraska, I mean, Daniels is gone. Yeah, Jordan Riley and Ash Huntmaker. Okay, or I think they're ready for that. I mean, I I, I feel like that's a, a portal. That's a hell of a good question. Evan. Portal concern or a JUCO addition? I think they need to address that too. I think they're going to try to address it. Um, yeah, I mean, I do. I think Nash Hupmaker can be a pretty good player eventually. I do. Oh yeah. You know, he talk about you know he was slow in high school. Now that I I believe that's changed. Um, Jordan Riley can play the position, uh, but you can't. Ex- what I what I mean by Casey Rogers is Casey Rogers was a football slash lacrosse player in high school and uh you know you wondered if he was going to make it at the, this level and he has mm-hmm. um but casey rogers plays his ass off like he's a he's a wild man and the effort level is 118 percent not every guy's going to be 118 percent you know they're just not and and as smart as casey is so casey's probably coach's son he's probably a 4.0 kind of football mind so you can't expect that of everybody and so you have to make sure you're getting great bodies too you know guys that can play in a couple of years instead of three or four so they're going after a couple of juco guys this weekend right cortez hogan's and who's the other yeah uh salita feveliki yeah or saliti feveliki yep so those guys would have to play right away and i think feldarius Payne is a loss you know he transferred out um, he did not have as good of a season as I think I anticipated he would. Same. Garrett Nelson surpassed. We haven't talked enough about Garrett Nelson's season because we focus a lot on JoJo. Garrett Nelson had a good season. He I mean, did. I think he had five and a half sacks and, I don't know, 13 or 14 tackles for loss. Uh, he had a good year. He wasn't perfect, but I thought Garrett Nelson played pretty good mm-hmm. in 2021. So, you know, uh, it would be nice to get a couple more, you know, guys like that. They They need to. They need to hit on a few players. And then um, who else transferred out? Marvin Scott transferred out. Daniels is gone. Um, you know, that hurts, but what are you going to do? And then Cam Jurgens, we've, it's our understanding he may leave. Yeah. And that would hurt too. Uh, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be great, but you know, they have linemen and they can, they can put somebody in there and Ethan Piper or somebody else. So. Yeah. I, I think that'll. I, I'm not as worried about the offensive line as other people are. You get guys that can work together, and they're in a scheme where they know what the hell's going on, and they'll get it figured out. And I think I really do think Rayola will do a pretty good job. I I think there's a lot of undue pressure on him because of his last name, and there's been a couple of things that have been written already saying, well, the reason he's good is because of his last name that I don't think are helpful. I don't think that's helpful. I don't think it's helpful to. To, to put this all about his last name. I think he's I think he'll I think coaching for four years in the NFL gives you an advantage. Uh, and hopefully he's able to translate that to the kids. Mm. Hey, and, and you look at just the way that Nebraska's been recruiting and offering guys both in high school and the portal, uh, they're hitting hard defensively. And part of that's because they haven't had an offensive staff in place to recruit those guys. Mm-hmm. But you can also tell i mean they feel like they need to add some depth in the secondary uh, we just touched on defensive line they're gonna uh, i think likely have a couple of those junior college linemen in here this weekend but you know your next commitment might be from uh this four-star defensive back Jaden gould who who decommitted from 
USC when when the coaching change happened there. Oh. Uh, he was in Nebraska for a visit last weekend. He'd become their highest rated guy. Um, Emmett Johnson from Minneapolis, the Minneapolis area. He's a running back who it's, it sounds like Nebraska is going to offer this weekend. Very similar to Hartzog, only he plays in a big city, and Hartzog plays mm-hmm. in a very, very small town. But Emmett Johnson's good. So I think I guess my point being the offers skinny but good. are reflecting sort of what we're talking about, where Nebraska is going to have an overhaul in the secondary. It's going to have a lot of new faces out there. Defensive line, they're they're going to need to put some guys that haven't proven themselves uh, in the trenches long term. Next year, that'll be fun to talk about in January. We'll we'll go through the whole roster and yeah. we'll talk about every position. By then, I think we'll know who's gone. Um, I could talk about that for hours. Mm-hmm. The defense, I could talk about for hours because I think we both understand what they're trying to accomplish on that side of the ball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like when you watch them, you know what's going on, and we could talk about that for a long time because I think, I think they can be almost as good as they were this year with a few tweaks. The offense just is a mystery. But the big question is, you know, the season that just completed, as much as the offense struggled, you knew that the defense would generally be there. And it generally was. It had its moments of struggle, but it did well. You don't really know. I mean, they have guys that have been in the system, but we haven't seen them play out. So I just, I wonder how much Nebraska can lean on that side of the ball next year when they don't have the fifth and sixth year guys that they had in abundance this year. Should be interesting. You're right, man. But when you know why things succeed or fail, it is the best. It's almost better than succeeding and not knowing why. <laughs> and the way that I think that the, the coordinator on that side and those coaches have gotten it to a point where their base defense is what they spend a lot of time in, and they've gotten really good at it. And then it becomes a question of the pieces. And be- in my opinion, it's great to get to that moment where when you fail, you know why. With Nebraska's offense, and I'm not trying to despair it, like, I, I'm not smart enough to know when I'm watching. I'm like, why in the hell did that happen? Like, there are times when things would happen on offense and you'd be like, or the two times when they were playing Oklahoma or somebody, Michigan State, and they're running those goofy plays where Adrian's running to his side and he's throwing a Brody Bell who's falling out of bounds like he's going to take a fallaway jumper. Or Austin Allen who's, you know, four inches from the sideline. And you're like, why are you running that play? Why did Luke McCaffrey run the play against Illinois to start the game? Like that kind of stuff. There's so much more logic with the defense. And I think what's going to come to the offensive side of the ball is at least an internal understanding of why things are being done versus are they going to go under center? Like, we we should go back and do cut-ups and just figure out how many different ways Nebraska addressed third and short this year or fourth and short. Mm. Do you know how many ways they went about that? Many, like many. Like about 20. Many, many. I'm not kidding. Like from formations, uh, quarterback sneak under center. Oh, Badrian fumbles. Quarterback sneak, you know. Uh, fourth and goal from the half inch line, uh, you know, giving it to Jack Quesiant. Fourth and one at Michigan State, speed option, um, you know, yeah, load right. option runs with double blockers, uh, you know, weird zone plays that don't work, um, you know, like jump Teddy Prohaska in the game is a tight end and he burns his red shirt. Like these guys did everything possible all the, like they, they it's like their ideation was unbelievable but what you'd love to do is say we're gonna have like three ways to do this and we're just gonna get good at those yeah. <laughs> or we'll know why we failed if we do and sometimes with nebraska i didn't think they always you know like they did so many different things that how would you always know hmm. yeah, that's a good point and i i think the players didn't always know i mean you you, you we would talk to them afterwards about certain plays and certain things they didn't always in fact, they seemed like more often than not, they didn't have a great specific answer to why something went the way that it did, other than I have to go back and watch the film. Yeah. Yeah. A few more minutes here. You want to talk hoops? Yeah, let's do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit of women's basketball, too. Uh, just the contrast between the two teams at this point. There was a moment today at the press conference between Fred Hoiberg and Amy Williams, and Fred was walking out, and Amy was walking in. And just they had a quick exchange. 
you know, and it was just pleasantries. I think they're friendly, you know, and they know each other fairly well. And, you know, Fred made a comment, hey, you guys are doing great. You know, keep it going. This, you know, and, and, and he talked a little bit about his team and she responded and all that. But it was interesting because it was kind of like two very different programs at this moment. Um, the women's program, we'll start with this. I think the thing that, that is true of them and is probably uh, important to the discussion about the men is I think Amy and I think this is her seventh year now, really has, I think, fine-tuned who she wants the program to be at Nebraska, which is different. It's a major public university and a major conference. That is different than South Dakota, which isn't uh, in a major conference. I think she's figured out who she wants to be at Nebraska, who she wants the team to be, and I think she's been able to figure out the kind of pieces that she wants and the kind of team that she wants. And uh, it's a big team with a big roster and a lot of depth with a lot of kids who fit the profile that Amy wants in terms of personalities. And it took her a while, I think, to get to that point because she inherited a couple of recruits who I thought were different and needed to be very prodded uh, and would have been prodded if Connie Yori had remained, but needed hard coaching. And I think we're often very quiet and somewhat inconsistent with leaders. It took her time to get the kind of players that she wanted, and I think she kind of has those now. And her freshmen are absolutely those kind of players. Mm. Um, they're going to be – they're a good team. They're 9-0. and uh, I think I, right now I'd put them in the NCAA tournament, maybe as an 8, 7, 8 seed. But they're going to get better if they can keep these players together because of the kinds of players that they are. Kind of no-nonsense, tough-minded, a lot of different things. And so she's been able to do that. And then the thing that she absolutely did, and it's it's kind of been undercovered, is the player that they added from Oregon, Jazz Shelley, is a great player. Like, it, it's not a good player. It's, it's a great player. Better than any transfer that Fred Hoiberg has added by some margin. This is a player who's on the Australian national team hmm. and is probably going to play in the WNBA which is hard to make. Jazz Shelley is a great player. And they they haven't said a lot, and Shelley is not the kind of, she's not flashy. She's a kind of quieter kid who likes being an Australian and being with her friends and all this, so they haven't pushed her out too much. Yeah. And Sam Hybee's still sort of the leader. And Sam's a great player too, but Jazz Shelley's a great player. And so when they added that, all of a sudden, all of the things that they couldn't do last year suddenly became, they could do them. And Jazz is still shooting 53, 54% from three. It's unbelievable. Then you contrast that with the men. The chemistry with the men isn't great. No. It's just not. The chemistry is off. They have influenza right now, which is part of it. But there's also this sense of that, that the pieces that they needed to have come in and be stabilizing forces are almost, what's the right word I'm looking for? Not divisive but provocative forces. Hmm. Alonzo Versch is a very gifted player. I think we can both see that. But he's polarizing. Yeah. I think even perhaps within the team. <laughs> like, he's polarizing. And that part is tough. And then, of course, Trey McGowan's got hurt. Uh, Bryce McGowan's is an elite player who does not always know how to do things other than score. And Nebraska women's top freshman, her name is Kendall Coley, and Kendall has become the, one of their best defensive players, which is an odd thing. And she she has more of a niche role, a spot role, and she's good at it. And Bryce is asked to kind of carry things along with Verge. And my hunch is, as the season goes on with Bryce, it's going to be harder and harder to do that because teams are going to watch and they're going to be like, we're not going to do this, this, and this against this guy. We're going to take this, this, and this away. And all of a sudden, those 27-point games are going to become five-point games or nine-point games. And the shooting won't be there. Right. But that program right now, the men's program, is is in a bad spot. It's in a worse spot than the football team. At this moment, maybe that'll change. But at this moment, that program is in a worse spot than football. Because they're not supposed to be this bad. It's remarkable, isn't it? You think about the, the Scott Frost, Fred Hoiberg hires... 
and the I mean just the unanimous acclaim that they brought. I mean those were yeah. at the time the obvious choices, and uh, there was no reason to think that it would go poorly. But yeah, you're right. I mean it's it's amazing to think. What's Fred Hoiberg's record at Nebraska now? Nineteen and fifty, I think. It's it's, I mean, it's that's tough. That's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable, and I it's. You know, I, I think it's interesting to draw parallels between the two where you have these two offensive-minded gurus who have had success elsewhere running a certain style of offense, and it just hasn't translated. Whether that's the players, whether that's the league, whether whatever it might be, um, it's, been, it's been remarkable. And, and to think that there's still months of the season to go and the hardest part of the schedule to go, like, it feels like <laughs> if you don't, it feels like things could go off track really quickly. Yes, I mean, free falling. You you already have the injuries. Yes, um, there's a, there's the the transfer portal that's always an option, or just guys quitting like we yeah. saw against Michigan. McGowan's and Breidenbach are out. McGowan's is out for I don't know five, four or five more weeks. Breidenbach may be out the whole season. Man, um, and dude, they they can't shoot. They're not a good shooting team. They're a bad shooting team, and. Um, if there's one thing that I would have said that they could have done over, because I think I was fairly positive about the team five months ago. If there's one thing I would have said if I could have done it over, if they could have done it over, and I guess this would be Matt Alda Massey, who's currently on leave, is don't go out and recruit shooters, quote unquote, who are redshirt freshmen. Go out and recruit guys like Tim Miles did with Andrew White, and Andrew White burned Nebraska when he left after that one year. But he, you know what he could do? He could shoot. And how'd they know that? Because he did it at Kansas. Mm-hmm. And they went out and got some guys who played like five games. I mean, C.J. Walter played more than that, but Keon Edwards did not play at DePaul more than five games. C.J. Walter didn't play a lot last year, right? Right. How do you know they can shoot in the, at the collegiate level until you see it? Um, those were the two. Those were two of the guys that were supposed to come in and get this stuff done. Lat man didn't get it done at TCU. He was a better three point shooter in junior college. But again, you want to go get guys who have done it at the. If you're going to go into the portal at the major college level, you want to go get guys that have done it at that level. When Miles went into the portal, and I'm not trying to say that Tim Miles is coming back or that he needs to come back or he shouldn't have been fired, he went and got Andrew White. Andrew White was a pretty good shooter. That's what you got to get. And I think, unfortunately, that they don't have it. They don't have that guy. Trey McGowan's wasn't a good shooter when he came over. What Trey was good at is what Trey's been good at since he got here, driving and playing defense. Bryce McGowan's is an okay shooter. Uh, Casey is a decent shooter. But I think what people would tell you is Casey struggled at the beginning of his final year in junior college and got hot 30 games into the season. And he started going, I mean, he went off, man. Like he hit like 65% in the last 10 games or something. Well, you don't have you don't have 30 games here. You got to get it done early, and they just didn't. And now they're in trouble because they can't shoot. Hmm. I and mean, if, you're whole, if your whole offense is predicated on making those shots and you can't make those shots and you've drilled into your guys, don't shoot the 14-footer, what do you have left? You yeah. have Alonzo Verge driving to the lane and scoring 30 points, and you lose by 35. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, they they can't rebound. They defend sporadically. They can't shoot. I don't know what you can address in season. I don't know. I mean, it is just kind of what it is, and there hasn't, you know, it, maybe it's premature, maybe it's not, but just the future of the program in general. Like, do you have do you start having hot seat conversations with Fred Horberg the way people did with Scott Frost yeah. at, toward the end of year three? I don't know. I, it's, well, it's a tough it, conversation. It's rough right now. Let me add this about the fan experience at PBA. It, it, for many, many years, it's just been top, top notch uh, pre-COVID. You know, when teams don't make shots and you're in an arena, and I've been to a couple games with my kids this year. Um, that's an opportunity I have that I don't have in football, or you have in football. But we've gone to women's and we've gone to men's, and I'm just telling you that the women's experience is better. Because they're making shots and it's more fun. Those men's games, the the droughts have been long and painful. 
and there's 10,000 people in the arena, and there's about three concession stands open. And you're way better off from a concession standpoint, Evan, if you don't sit on the lower bowl. Hmm. If you sit in the upper levels, you can you can get to a concession stand and not have to wait for 17 minutes. You get in one of these other... It, so the experience there needs to get better. Like, they need to figure that out. Um, and when the team's not playing well, that place is, gets a little dreary. Whereas I think the Husker football games are always kind of festive. And you can just leave. The yeah. basketball games at night, you feel like, God dang, I got to leave and it's halftime. And there's nowhere to go out to my car and drink. or You can't do anything. You just go home. Yep. And so they're, they're going to run the risk here of getting that crowd down to about seven or 8,000. And there comes a point where your crowd's no longer really an asset. They're just people sitting in an arena. Mm-hmm. They have to figure this out quickly, or otherwise they're going to be... It's going to be two ships passing in the night. The women are going to start getting 7,000 ruckus fans, and the, the Husker men are going to get 7,000 fans that are just, you know, uh, flagellating themselves to be there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. got to figure that out. Uh-huh. I, agree. I agree. That's why baseball, which we'll talk about eventually, is so great. Because a, it's a real loyal fan base, but b, Wobo puts a product on the field that when you're in the middle of the fourth inning, you're still engaged. Your kid doesn't want to go to the playground because he's watching. You know, mm-hmm. like it feels like an event. It feels like there's stakes, and you can't lose that uh, with some of these sports. Otherwise, people just stop coming. Mm, no doubt. Well, it, it's a busy time. I mean, volleyball's in the in the Sweet Sixteen. Yeah. Um, Best of luck to. Yeah, that'll be fun. Women's hoops, undefeated. Lots going on. We could talk more volleyball, but I just, you know, we'll see. How, if they get to the Final Four, we'll, we'll oh, talk more. Oh, absolutely. They they get to this point every year, and best of luck to them tonight and, uh, and Saturday, too. I, guess I think they'll win tonight. Just a, a parting shot, then. What are you looking for in the next week um, with the football team, with I do all, everything th- we're discussing? I do think you're going to see potentially that final hire fall into place. Um, I think you're going to see three or four more commits, including potentially this Miles Brennan situation. And then we won't know until signing day and the days after signing day whether more quarterbacks go into the portal. Mm-hmm. And you have to have SCS teams get eliminated. And when, as those teams get eliminated, then you're going to see a couple more quarterbacks go in, and and uh, we'll just see. Yeah. Well, it's been a warm winter in terms of temperature. It could be a cold one if you're following men's athletics in Nebraska too closely with football and men's hoops. Got a lot of other stuff going on, though. We'll be back next week. It could be the decoldest winter. If it could be decoldest. Crawford. Decoldest winter. I think they're going to get him. They might. I do. There's a rumor out there, and I need to confirm it, that his middle name is <laughs> It's either to ever do it is his middle name, potentially. Yeah. But then I heard that that wasn't true, and I heard his middle name was actually Juan, the coldest Juan Crawford. Okay. So I need to, if he commits, man, that's that's priority one is to figure out what his actual middle name is. Oh, but, I mean, it's a, it's a great name, and he's a good player. Um, again, I think Nebraska gets, and other programs too, get a benefit from Brian Kelly being the guy. I don't know why LSU hired him. I don't know. As a parting shot, I don't know why they <laughs> hired him. Yeah. Brian Kelly is a good football coach. I have no idea whether he will be any good at that job in the South. He has he's a Southern a, accent already. He's a Boston. He's the son of Boston Boston politicians. He was a good fit at Notre Dame. He'd be a good fit at, I don't know, Michigan State, Boston College, Syracuse, Pittsburgh. I don't really see LSU. I think he's going to run afoul of people there very quickly and rub people the wrong way. Very, very fast. I don't know why they hired him. Mm. I mean, I, I know they wanted to hire Lincoln Riley first, I'm sure. But you could have went and got Billy Napier, and there would have been a seamless transition. Now, maybe he wouldn't have won as many games as you wanted, but I don't get Brian Kelly. And then he let go of all their, you know, like, get out of here, strength coach. Get out of here, Corey Raymond, who's been here for 10 years and is an elite recruiter. And Get out of here, Mickey Joseph. We don't want you. I'm like, what? You're getting rid of all these people, and you're bringing your guys in? Guys who don't know anything about Louisiana? Yeah. Oof, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. I think it's gonna I think it's gonna fail. Hmm. Spectacularly. 
Whereas I think Lincoln Riley at USC will be just fine. Yeah, probably Whether so. they win a natty, I don't know, but they're going to win a couple Pac-12 titles with Lincoln Riley. And some recruiting titles potentially, no too. No question. Do you, I mean, can you give them say about Brian Kelly? I don't get I it. Do. The I culture, don't get the it culture clash is it's awkward. It's uh, it's Dana Altman calling the Hogs awkward. Yes, that, perfect. Right, like it's just yes. they're uncomfortable with it. Like what? Uh, Meanwhile, Notre Dame got a great head coach. That guy oh. is going to be great. Man, is he Marcus in, Freeman? Yes, really impressive. Oh, they 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 won that. Uh, I think Notre Dame fell into a terrific situation where they got rid of a guy. I mean, a guy left that <laughs> rubs everybody the wrong way, kinda. It's kind of autocratic to a guy that everybody can love. Yeah. And I think they're going to win. I think Notre Dame's going to win big in this process, and I think LSU's going to be back on the market in five years. Hmm. All right. We'll be back next week. Signing day. Lots to talk about. Probably another coaching hire, too. Thanks for listening.